understand is that these actually interact with each other on similar levels of abstraction. Okay? Yep. How many neurons take you from like the bottom of that structure to um, I don't know. It's in some cases they can estimate it for vision because you can figure out how long it takes, and it's it's actually very few. I, don't I, I would say that you can probably do less than ten uh, hops from the bottom to the top. Then. Ten hops, do you? <laughs> it's, it's something that's from vision type things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so it's hand wavy because there are always a few shortcuts. And, you you uh, said it's ten neurons from, from the bottom to the top. Is that what you said? Up the hierarchy, yeah. Yeah, um, really. But it's not an exact number by any means. So. Yeah. You but can you can get nice little loops aside and uh, deviations. Mm -hmm. Basically, you can present an image down here and you can see how fast it, it recognizes Bill Clinton up here. And you know how fast information propagates through neurons, so you can calculate it basically. Right, I need to get moving, so um, mm -hmm. questions might have to wait for a pop. Okay, so this is quite an interesting structure. It looks like something you might actually design if you're building an AI. Now, there's actually more going on. So I was talking under here, you've got this all this subcortical stuff. Now this here is basically just a model of what's going on in the world. And it's, the information doesn't just go up, by the way, it comes back down. So you can actually see something and be expecting at a conceptual level to see something and it can interact with each other. And the same here, the information goes up and down. Because it has very, very similar properties. Okay, so um, underneath this we've got another system down here which has all kinds of things in it. And some of the things that it does is essentially like a reinforcement learning kind of system. I was talking about before. And so what happens is you, at an abstract level you could say, okay, we have an environment, the information comes up here, it gets processed from simple, from raw representation up to very abstract conceptual representation. On the other side we have our executive process which generates our actions back out to an environment. We have our low level stuff, we have very conceptual stuff over here. And then we have a reward system on top of us, which which sort of is the, the goals and directs and modulates the, uh, modulates the whole thing. Okay, now, how does this, we're going to, I'll, I'll begin with this system. How does this system, how does this system work? What do we know about it? Turns out, we've actually learned a lot about it. We're making yeah. a lot of progress at the moment about this. The last 10, last 5 years, huge amount of progress. And it's really amazing what we're discovering. We're discovering that the brain is using a whole bunch of algorithms that we already knew about. <coughs> algorithms we already discovered in machine learning. Of course, it's not using some of the algorithms, like it's not going to use a least squared algorithm, which is really optimal, you need a big matrix, you invert it, it's pretty hard to do in neural computation. It works really well. So we, can, we actually have better algorithms than what the brain is using, in some senses, though they have higher time complexity. Anyway. Um, but yeah, standard algorithms that we know about, the brain is actually using these algorithms. It's really incredible. So, one algorithm is temporal difference learning. Now, I was going to put the equation up, but I figured we'd probably have fatigue by this point. So, um, so the idea is actually very, very simple. What you do is you remember the V function we had before. That's the expected reward. Okay. So, what you do is you have a model in your system. What is the expected reward in the state of the world? What's the expected reward? I, I mean, what do I expect in the future? How how good is this? And then what happens is that you experience what comes next. And what you do is you compare what you expected with what actually happened, you look at the difference, and then you update your model based on the difference. So if you expected to get a big high out of something and it turned out to be not so great, you're going to update your model so in the future in that situation you're not going to expect as much as you previously did. And you incrementally update your model. And you can ad adapt the other way as well. Now, if we go looking in the brain, this is in the um, dopaminergic systems. Dopamine is, it seems to be a key thing in this whole process. This is the dopaminergic um, neurons in um, VTA, ventral, ventral valerian. Yep. Um, and so, what happens? Okay, to start with, um, we, 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 this, is, this is the beginning. We, sh we have a stimulus. This is, this is the old stuff. I'm showing you like some pretty original things. There's much, actually much better recordings. It's nice going back to the, some of the more original stuff. So, okay, we show a stimulus at this point. Uh, the monkey goes, oh, okay. And then we give it a reward at this point, and just after the reward, there's a big jump in the activity of these neurons. And so what's happened is that it didn't expect anything great to happen, but all of a sudden something did. 
And so there's a difference between its expectation and what actually happened. There's a big positive difference. I didn't expect that anything cool was going to happen after I saw this. Wow, that's really good. I didn't expect chocolate bars to taste so good. I ate the chocolate bar. Wow, that's really good. So you update your model so that next time you eat a chocolate bar, you, you, or you see a chocolate bar, you expect it's going to be tasty, right? And so what happens after a while is that you show the stimulus, then there's an increase here because it's expecting the future to have a certain amount of reward. When you actually give it the chocolate bar, well, it's actually juice, that's what they usually use. Monkeys love juice. Um, there's, there's no spike anymore, right? Because it's updated its model. There's no error. There's no difference. You see, see the algorithm working? And then you can do, this, you can do the same thing. Um, you can... Is that going off the edge? No. So you can... Um, Show the uh, you can show the uh, the stimulus. Then you get a spike here. If you present the stimulus, there's no there's no nothing happens because it's as expected. If you don't give it the reward, suddenly this these drop down, and it actually that's sort of like a negative, right? It's a negative prediction, and so it then has to update its model the other way. So this is the old stuff, and there's been a ton of stuff following this, and it's and it's. Basically, what we're finding is the brain is using a whole bunch of algorithms we already know about. It's really incredible. So, there's tons of stuff. I'm only going to, I'm not an expert in it, I'm just going to show you a few bits of it. Okay, so this is a bit problematic representing a negative sign in a spiking neural network, right? So, this is a bit difficult. Well, turns out that there's a part called the habenula which is computing the negative of this. That makes it much easier. So, if you were actually designing the system in a neural net, You've probably put this in yourself. Um, does the brain use model based on model free reinforcement learning? Um, this is a big split within the area. Um, some methods, okay, I'm not going to go into it. Some methods have an internal model of the world, and then they can do much more powerful things, but it's a lot more computationally expensive. Other methods are sort of model free, are much more computationally cheap, but they're more limited in what they can do. So you have a trade-off between the power of what you're able to do and how much computation you have to do. Now, what does the brain do? Some people in the field, you know, in machine learning do these, some people do these. What does the brain do? It does both. It does both and it switches. It knows when to switch. When it can use the cheap system, it uses the cheap system. When that's not good enough, it switches over to the more expensive system. And you can actually identify which parts are doing computing these different systems. And if you have a, a mouse or whatever that's damaged in one of these parts, you can show this performance reverts back to the irritable performance of these types of algorithms when they don't when it doesn't have the ability to switch anymore. So it's pretty clear it's using both both types, both types that we've actually developed long before we knew this was going on in the brain. It, it, it already figured that out and why not use both types and just intelligently switch. Um, another trick that we use in practice is we have pseudo rewards. Uh, so for informative cues and things like that we don't know if it's going to associate with any reward in the future but it could be useful so as a general heuristic we might want to re internally reward the system for doing that turns out the brain's using that trick too it's stealing all our tricks <laughs> um, how does it deal with com complex temporal sequences so the way we do this in reinforcement learning is we use something called hierarchical reinforcement learning. And I'm not going to explain it all, but this is a typical sort of hierarchical reinforcement learning model. It's got all the different bits in there. This is the error of the rewards. It's a temporal difference. So-called actor critic model, blah, blah, blah. I haven't got time to explain it, but these are all the parts of the brain that seem to be doing all these bits. Now, I presented this to a, a, a group of neuroscientists. Some of them are quite expert in this, including neuroscientists from other parts of UCL and some visitors from America who work in this stuff. And you know what they told me? I gave an hour long talk just on this. It's not my work, it's, it's, I was summarizing the work of these guys here. And what they kept saying was, they didn't say this is wrong, they said, aha, but we know over here or over here or wherever, they said we know more than this. The brain is not just doing this, but it also does this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, this. So this is actually just a simplified model of, of what we know. And th these, these aren't boxes where we, you know, we don't know what's going on. <coughs> these are algorithms we already knew about. We already coded these. You can download code that does these types of hierarchical reinforcement. 
we're actually starting to understand how, how the uh, reinforcement learning is going on in the brain. It's really quite amazing.